Further debate? I recognize the member from Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to speak on Bill 195. Speaker, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, I've been willing to quarantine partisanship and work with all parties in this House. And while I've often criticized the government for not doing more to help people during the pandemic, I have also worked with them to provide unanimous consent to extend the state of emergency and to even pass bills that help people, like a commercial rent eviction ban, even if the bill did not do enough to provide the support people and businesses need. But, Speaker, I have to draw the line at Bill 195. How can the government members opposite stand here with a straight face in this House, calling for an end to the state of emergency, yet retain the extraordinary powers that should only exist during a state of emergency? It establishes a dangerous precedent, but that's exactly what Bill 195 does. And it gives the government the power to extend these orders for up to two years without having to pass any new legislation and without meaningful oversight. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association has said, and I quote, the proposed legislation is unnecessary and eliminates essential democratic controls over unprecedented emergency powers. It is a significant threat to democratic oversight that should be rejected, end quote. Speaker, the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act is far from perfect. But one important element that exists in that act is a requirement to come back to this House to extend a state of emergency every 28 days. Bill 195 would eliminate this democratic oversight. Instead, Bill 195 gives the executive, the premier, the unprecedented ability to extend or amend extraordinary powers for another year with an option for two years. Speaker, right up until the next election, imagine, just imagine the outrage from government members if any of the opposition parties were in power and put forward such legislation to provide them to extend extraordinary powers for two years. Speaker, to quote the CCLA again, and I quote, the powers governments have under emergency legislation are supposed to be exceptional. Bill 195 would make the exercise of those powers the new normal, end quote. Think about that. Extraordinary government powers, the new normal. One of the most troubling of those powers is that the government will have the power to keep orders in place that allow employers to override collective bargaining agreements. I've consulted with health care workers, Speaker, and they have told me that employers are doing exactly that right now. They are overriding collective agreements, for example, by denying vacation or ignoring seniority clauses in the name of COVID, despite there being no cases in that facility. I'm worried that the government is using COVID to undermine constitutionally protected collective bargaining rights. I'm also extremely concerned about the lack of an effective democratic oversight mechanism for these extraordinary powers. We have placed great trust in the government during this pandemic during the state of emergency. But unfortunately, as we've seen this House dissolve into partisan antics over the last few weeks, that trust is starting to erode. Recently, the government has not engaged opposition parties in the drafting of COVID-related bills such as Bill 195. It's rushed controversial and non-COVID-related bills through the House and through committee. It's rushed through bills that ignore the lessons of COVID-19, such as Bill 175 that opens the door to more privatization in home and community care. It's canceled House leaders' meetings and called bills for debate with little or no notice to the opposition, and more importantly for the people of Ontario to engage around those bills. 
So, Speaker, you can see why people don't trust this government to have such extraordinary powers for the next two years. And that's why the government needs to provide more oversight through a more balanced select committee. Last night, I called on the government to support the official opposition's motion to at least provide a bit more balanced oversight for the select committee mentioned in Bill 195. And speaker after speaker on the government benches said they would vote against that. And so I want to remind the government what I said last night for the members who may or may not have been here. Whether intended or not, Bill 195 feels more like a power grab than a real mechanism for ensuring democracy and oversight as we respond to COVID-19. So I will be voting against Bill 195, but I will offer some advice to my colleagues on the opposite benches, that the people of this province will not support a government that uses the cover of COVID for a power grab. So proceed cautiously. Thank you. Questions? I recognize the member from University Rosa. Thank you, Speaker, uh, and thank you to the member for Guelph uh, for your presentation. Uh, I've also heard from healthcare workers, personal uh, support workers, uh, nurses about the um, consequences of what this bill could mean to their working conditions. Could you elaborate? What are you hearing from healthcare workers about what this bill could mean uh, for their working conditions? Re response, the member from Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I got a little too excited there, so thank you. I appreciate the member's question. Um, you know, this bill affects close to 30 emergency orders, and many of them, if you look at the details, actually deal with work orders, many of them helping to support frontline health care workers. And so what those workers are telling me is they're deeply concerned that their constitutional bargaining rights are going to be overridden because of these emergency orders. Things like vacations, things like staffing, things like seniority, uh, et cetera, things that affect the day-to-day -day work life for these frontline heroes. Question? Member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you to my, my colleague uh, and a good friend. You, uh, during your speech, uh, you constantly said uh, power grab, power grab, and uh, and as my respected colleague over here, <laughs> during uh, her uh, speech as well too, uh, she constantly said about power grab. Uh, see, uh, the people of this province trusted us uh, in, in, in doing a, a job so to make uh, good decisions uh, for them and uh, to, to basically uh, make their life uh, easy and you know, make it comfortable. And especially during this pandemic, this is exactly what uh, we as a government have been doing. So to my, my colleague uh, across the, the aisle, uh, I just want to understand, like, when you say power grab, where do you see in this bill Thank that you. says that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. A reminder to all members, if you direct your, uh, stop the clock, if you direct your comments to and through the chair, you'll have a better sense of the timing. Uh, I will return to the member from Guelph for his answer. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate uh, my colleague's question. The power grab, and whether it's intended or not, is that extraordinary executive power exists during a state of emergency. So that's why it requires the legislature to debate and approve an extension of that extraordinary executive power every 28 days. And so to cement that, in the executive for a year, possibly two years, up until the next election, is an exceptional power amount of power in the hands of the executive of this province. And I think the people of Ontario, they require oversight. And one of the ways that oversight happens is through the Response. members of this legislature. And I would encourage all members, regardless of party, not to give up that power for such a long period of time. Further question? 
The member from Hamilton Mount. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the member from Guelph for his perspective on this bill. Um, I know myself, as well as all of our, our colleagues here in the House, have heard from our constituents about the things that they need in their daily lives whether it be help to get into long-term care, whether it be help with their children with special needs, uh, whether they're, they're trying to uh, just fix simple things that happen every day in our lives, like with Ministry of Transportation. I mean, the, the issues have been endless. With a title uh, such as this and the reopening of, um, of our communities, do you see our community's voices and what you're hearing in your constituency office reflected in this bill today. Response? The member. I appreciate the member's question. And I, the only thing I've heard on this bill from constituents is concern. Concern about the precedent that we would be establishing with this bill to put so much power in the hands of the executive. I can recall conservatives across the country being outraged when the federal liberals wanted to give themselves power, like extraordinary powers for a couple years or almost two years. So that's why I'm surprised that the members opposite, which generally don't like big government and they don't like to see power in, concentrated in the hands of the executive, are supporting this bill. And I would think if, if the opposition, if we had gotten in the way and not granted unanimous consent for emergency orders, um, I could see maybe why the government would respond in this way. But when it's come time to pass bills to help people, nobody is denied unanimous consent to do that. Thank you. Further questions? A member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for your statement. And I, I, I always do uh, appreciate listening to and hearing your, your point of view on, on pieces of legislation. Um, just a question with regard to the, you know, when we talk about the Emergency Management and uh, Civil Protections Act, um, some, of the, some of the items noted during debate, uh, the proposed bill will introduce new accountable, accountability mechanisms uh, that was not previously found in the Emergency Management and Prote Civil Protections Act. That's a hard thing to say. Um, does the member opposite agree that additional accountability is important when it comes to the next phase of managing the COVID-19 pandemic? Response, the member from Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the member's question. And yes, that is a mouthful. So uh, yes, we need additional oversight, which is exactly why I'm opposed to Bill 195. I mean, the current... Um, Emergency and Management and Civil Protection Act, it has an important accountability mechanism in it. It requires the government to come back to this legislature and ask for an extension every 28 days. What the government is asking us to do, and we need to be very clear about this, they're asking us to allow the government to extend or amend existing emergency orders for the next year with an option to increase it to two years. That is, that is a dangerous precedent. And I asked the members opposite to think about one of the questions that was asked earlier today, that what Response. if a green NDP or liberal government was asking for such extraordinary powers? Would you sit there and want to grant it? Do you want to do that? Do you want to establish this precedent for the future? Thank you. Further questions? I recognize the member from St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. Um, to the member from Guelph, um, the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, the EMCPA, was put into place to allow this government to declare a state of emergency and issued orders re relate related to that. So, do you feel that if the government wants to do uh, this and extend emergency orders? Well, Speaker, I appreciate the member's question. I mean, the short answer is yes, <laughs> they could do that. They have extraordinary powers under the state of emergency. And um, I think I want to, I need to correct my record because I said no one has denied unanimous consent. I do re recall, I think the member from Lanark did. So one member has, but then we all debated the extension and have approved it. So in extending the state of emergency, a denial of that while we're in a state of emergency hasn't happened. And 
So that's why I don't understand why the government needs to bring forward something that extends these extraordinary powers without that 28-day accountability uh, for the next year. Uh, <laughs> further question? Sorry. I recognize a member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you. Madam Speaker, um, my question for the member is, uh, members joined uh, myself and many others at Standing Committee on Finance, and one of the consistent themes we hear is how can we support uh, Ontarians with the psyche piece? The declaration of emergency has uh, done its part. I mean, it traditionally was designed for not these prolonged global pandemics. So uh, how do we juxtapose the, this legislation, which Question. gives the government the ability to wind down those powers uh, over a prolonged period of time, with what you're hearing on Finance Committee, which is end the declaration of state of emergency, because we're not in one, um, and we can still be Thank exercise you. safety and health over the long, prolonged period of time. Right? Quick response, the member from Guelph. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. So I think the, the short answer is, is um, if we're not in a state of emergency, then let's end the declaration and let's end the extraordinary powers that the Premier has. Uh, if we're still in a state of emergency, then we will pass legislation for a state of emergency so the government can respond quickly to that emergency. The existing legislation provides the government with the ability to do that.